<clears throat> so I've been uh, very pleased and flattered by 99% um, of the comments and uh, people have encouraged me to continue my reminiscences about Balanchine and New York City Ballet, etc. And again, I've been advised not to give away too much that's in my book, which hopefully will come out this spring. But uh, later today, I'm going to teach a private class for a very talented uh, boy, 15-year-old, which I don't usually do, but I love to teach. I love teaching, but I really can only teach um, serious students. I'm not good at teaching adult beginners. I can't do it. And um, I've taught as young as uh, kids that are 12 years old, but boy, some 12-year-old kids are <laughs> incredible dancers. So, so I need to teach um, those that I think can get something out of it. And I actually love teaching maybe more than choreographing. Um, but I thought I would uh, focus this chat on uh, Balanchine's classes. And when I first uh, had Mr. B's classes, he was only 62 years old. And he still would demonstrate lots of things, including one day jumping up and doing a perfect double tour, which freaked us all out, needless to say, because he wasn't warm and he was wearing his typical slacks and little loafers and his uh, denim western shirt. And he just wanted uh, Paul Mejia to do a faster double tour and he jumped up and did it. And we all were like, my God. So Balanchine was very, very physical in class. And he would never sit down when he was teaching. He rarely sat down when he was choreographing. Only later when he had illnesses, and of course he would sit. But um, about his teaching, um, at that point, I had already had a lot of classes with Asaf Messerer. I had had privates for six weeks with Anton Dolan. I had studied with Maya Plasetskaya, David Lachine, Eugene Loring, a whole host of uh, wonderful teachers. But nothing really prepared me for Balanchine's class. It wasn't so much the speed, it was the repetition um, and the full-out energy he demanded from all of the dancers. There was no such thing as taking it easy in class. I mean, he pushed you pretty much to your limit. He knew when to relax it. If we were on tour, certain things, he would be a little bit more relaxed, gentle, let's say. Uh, he always was funny in class, so you never felt like you were working. It was, he was playing, we were playing, we got a lot done. He would concentrate on sometimes a particular step in class, just glissades sometimes or whatever which used to irritate the hell out of people like Peter Martins, who was a big turner, and Peter was furious that Balanchine would only let the boys do two pirouettes, just a double, in class. <clears throat> Once in a while, you could squeeze in a triple, but he didn't like tricks. Not in class. Not at all. I mean, and even this high extension thing. Um, yes, he wanted you to get your legs up as high as you could, but not where it became acrobatic or distorted, or, and I talk a lot about that in the book. But... Balanchine's classes changed when he got older. I would say, you know, well, it might have been the brain disease, which took a few years to manifest, but it's also when he became more feeble with knee operations, a triple heart bypass, and then his classes changed quite a bit. So I always like to focus on the classes I got the first few years before he had his illnesses, when he was 62, 63, 64, 65, all the way into his um, 70s, early 70s, he was fine. and. At the end, I had already started my company in L.A., but I would still come back to New York pretty regularly. Um, he I, either would invite me back to guest dance, something like Halakanad or Symphony Three Movements or any of my old repertory, Port and Superior, the electronic nightmare ballet. Um, but um, I noticed this class is changing from what they were like when I was in the company full time. And uh, they're getting insanely fast at the bar. And also because of his age and everybody knew instinctively that, you know, maybe he wouldn't be around a lot longer, his classes got very full. Now, when he was 62, when I joined the company, not everybody took his class. There were really only maybe 20 of us diehards that took every single day. Suzanne Farrell, of course, Jacques D'Amboise, Violette Verdi, Marnie Morris, Renee Stopinol, who's my generation, then later, when Christine Redpath joined, she took class. Susie Hendel was there. Kay Mesa was there every day. But the majority of the company would come in and out. They'd take two or three days of him, and they would go elsewhere, usually Stanley Williams at SAB School. Stanley was very popular, the most popular teacher in New York. 
Nureyev and uh, Brun were there together all the time. Valella never took Balanchine's class. He said it was too hard on his muscles. He had very heavy, thick muscles, and he said it was just, he just couldn't do it. So he would take Stanley's, and Eddie talks about this, so I'm not criticizing anybody or telling tales out of school, you know. And Peter didn't like Balanchine's classes, at least for the years I was in the company. Later on, I understand he would take more regularly, but um, for at least seven years, he didn't take hardly at all. And there was a lot of uh, contretemps between him and Balanchine about this, but I go into it in detail in my book. Anyway, Peter's training was different. He liked uh, Stanley Williams' classes because that was more Danish. And of course, Peter was from the Royal Danish Ballet, so that was more comfortable for him. Uh, I argued with him all the time. I said, why aren't you taking Balanchine's classes? I mean, he's the one. And Peter just didn't want to do it, so, and Balanchine was upset about it, but. I loved Balanchine's classes. They were hard, fast. As I said, he told lots of jokes. He was hysterical. He had a very dry sense of humor, my favorite kind. He was quite vulgar in class, which would probably not be politically correct today, but it was a different time period, and we should not judge I think uh, it's called presentism, uh, which is when you, you expect people of a different generation, different culture, to act the way people act today in our culture. It's just not fair to expect a time jump like that. It's really not. Um, Balanchine would be quite um, racy in class. He could be very flirty. Um, I said somewhere on a posting that he used to slap the girls on the butts to get them to have tight fannies. But he slapped the boys too. So it wasn't a sexual gesture. It was a thing to get us to have our innards and our derrieres not relaxed. He wanted everything to be in one piece. Now, I'm not going to get into, uh, I think it's impossible, uh, all the balancing technique things here, but it is interesting that uh, it can be learned, balancing style, balancing classes, relatively quickly. Um, as you know, if, if you've followed me at all, I've staged ballets all over the world from companies, Mexico City, to China, to <clears throat> Korea, to Japan, to the Bolshoi, the Mariinsky, 10 ballets to the Paris Opera, etc. So what I've found, La Scala, what I found is that to get the ballets to look correctly, I need to um, teach. I need to teach a balancing style, not pure balancing. That would be a bit cruel if they're not used to it, but uh, teach a balancing light, balancing style class every day a company class, so that the dancers get the feeling of what it's like to dance in true balancing style. Now, most of the other repetiteurs, ballet master for the trust, don't do that. I'm, I think I'm the only one that does it on a very regular basis. Uh, my last time was in Budapest, where they had had very little, no balancing, really. And I find the same thing happens everywhere, whether it's the Bolshoi or Paris Opera. Or... The first couple classes, it's a bit of a shock, because it's a very different feeling. The classes are not so much faster, but they're lighter. Um, there's not heavy plies. There's not an emphasis on planting the heel down in jumps. You do put your heel down. I don't want to get into this whole thing. There's a whole myth that Balanchine never wanted you to put your heel down. Well, that's a very complicated issue. Yes and no. So I'm not going to get into it here. Um, but it's been taken way out of hand now. There's a, a whole pseudo Balanchine technique that's been kind of accepted as gospel for the last 30 years, and it irritates the hell out of me, but not much I can do about it until dancers take my class. And then it gels, then things start happening. And one of the most stubborn companies was when Berlin uh, just reunited and I was staging some ballets for the Staatsoper, which had been in East Berlin, and that was open. But I was teaching every day, and boy, the first few days was hell because those dancers very old Soviet style very laid back in class nobody really wanted to work hard at all and I teach I don't just give a warm-up I teach um, <laughs> so I got a real blowback for the first day and I stopped the class and I let them have it and I said look you know I'm here to teach I'm not here to warm you up you can do that on your own or take another class do my exercises that's my phone ringing do my exercises as I give them or don't take my class Period. I said that the very first day to all these East Germans that were like looking at me like daggers. And the next day, a few of the dancers didn't show up, but the majority did. And then by the end of the week, I had them. I had them. And they came up to me and they said, you know, we thought you were crazy, John. We thought, we thought in the beginning your class was so different. We thought you were insane. But now we understand. 
we, we feel we're on our leg more. We actually can move faster and it's not so hard to move fast. And so I know the balancing style works when it's taught correctly. And again, I don't think you can dance a balancing bat. Well, you can, but to dance it as well as you can do it, to do it correctly, you really need balancing style classes. And unfortunately, a lot of the teachers that are teaching balancing around the world or in New York only got the last few years of his classes. Now, I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. It's just the luck of the draw. It's just what happened. There's nothing to be ashamed of, but those are the facts. So, um, and there's also a, a, an excellent balancing ballet mistress who is, unfort I won't name her, but unfortunately I've noticed over the last few years, and I've called her on it, we've had discussions, why does she over -ex exaggerate balancing style when she's staging his ballets, especially for European companies? Why is she, I said, why do you, you know, yes, the hip is forward, but it's not like a stripper, it's not like a Las Vegas show, and yeah, he wanted the legs high, but not to the point of grotesquerie. I mean, and she said that it, she found that to get the dancers to even approach Balanchine when they haven't been trained, she has to over-exaggerate the style so they'll get it. But see, I found that the dancers around the world now are all so much better. This woman's been doing it for 30, 40 years, but I find now that the dancers around the world in general, that's my phone again, are so well trained, um, they can pick up the style pretty quickly, really. Uh, to make them comfortable is when, you know, I think they need the classes in the morning so that they kind of start the day already revved up, as it were. And um, so specifically about the balancing technique, it's pre-Vaganova. And I've gotten into some little arguments with people that think he was trained by Vaganova. No, 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 no. He was at this imperial school uh, before Vaganova. Uh, she was there actually dancing, but she wasn't teaching. And he um, even says he saw her in a rehearsal. Um, then I think, historically speaking, she went away and taught at another school and then came back after the revolution. Um, but I don't think he ever had a Vaganova class, even. He was taught by male teachers, predominantly. Anyway, um, so Balanchine style is closer, actually, to Bournonville and French, because that's all the root. And he didn't really like Cicchetti style at all. Uh, well, he could get a little harsh. <laughs> he didn't like Vaganova, which she was doing with the technique when she started teaching. Uh, so Balanchine style of class the closest to it was Pierre Vladimirov when I was first at SAB, and we had three male teachers, two classes a day, two classes a week with each of these teachers. Stanley Williams taught two, Andrei Glesky taught two, and Pierre Vladimirov, who had partnered Pavlova, uh, part, uh, taught two male classes a week. And you got a really great mix that way. You got a really good mix. Stanley was very Danish. Uh, his classes changed too later, but Stanley's were very Danish and fast and light and brilliant footwork and he very very into line and very elegant and Agleski was more kind of what we consider Vaganov in a way because he used to go to the library of the performing arts and look at Kirov training films I caught him there one day and so he was giving us Kirov exercises so his classes were a little bit heavier big slow cabrioles you know lots of pirouettes because he was a turner like crazy and then but Pierre Vladimirov's classes were the closest to Balanchine's, and I found that out when I joined the company in the first Balanchine class, which I thought I was going to die in. But I was amazed at, it was so similar to Pierre Vladimirov, very fast at the bar. Oh my God, you know, he'd end the bar with incredibly fast uh, little jetés and fast tendus at the speed of light. And that was his last bar step every day, same thing. Very fast, I mean, it's faster than Balanchine, it's crazy. But it was an interesting, um, old, old Russian pre-Soviet style of classical ballet and that's what Balanchine kept in his classes and Balanchine didn't experiment in class it wasn't like he gave jazzy combinations like Eddie Valella would do in his class he gives kind of jazzy things no, Balanchines were very basic very pure uh, emphasizing just glissades or tendus or pirouettes some classes could just be port de bras he was very big on port de bras and somebody recently asked me um in Balanchine's abstract ballets, you know, you're not supposed to act, but what do you do with your face? I mean, what do you do? And it was an interesting question, and my answer is that basically all that came from Balanchine's classes, because every port de bras had to mean something. It wasn't just 
lift your arm here, lift your arm there, bend over. <laughs> it was, he always had an alliteration. It was like you bend over to pick up a check or to pick up a flower and then you toss it over your head. Or when you do an arabesque, you reach like you're reaching for money. He would use money a lot because he knew we Americans are money crazy, but he would say you're reaching for money. And when you're pointing your foot, it's like you push down in an accelerator of a Ferrari, you know? So he was always giving us images about how he wanted the steps to look. It was always kinetic, it was always active based. It was never just a series of pretty poses. Um, okay, I'm getting into too many details here, but um, this all comes through and you can do that when you're teaching a Balanchine style class. And I always, I remember everything. As you've noticed, I have a crazy good memory. I remember everything he said. I remember every correction. Uh, I didn't even write him down. I barely missed a Balanchine class in the years I was with the company. And all the way until he died, I was coming back to take his classes. And that's why I feel bad, because his the last few years, because of the illnesses, his classes changed drastically. And, you know, I said it before, I asked him why he was getting too fast, and he said, because he didn't have much time left. You know, no more time, dear. That's exactly what he said. But um, some of the teachers now, unfortunately, the younger generation, they all teach that later style balancing which I don't consider really the true Balanchine because of his illnesses. I, the true Balanchine was what I consider the true. Now, it's also, I was told by older dancers, older generations, that his classes were different in the 1950s or 40s, that it was a more kind of regular, well-rounded ballet class, and I certainly believe that too. He would teach for the people he had in front of him, and I noticed this when he had dancers with an incredible technique that was developing like a Merrill Ashley. He would start teaching the class kind of for her in the sense that he was refining her technique. Now we all benefited. He once had a wonderful uh, energetic, fast, big jumping girl in the company named Gloria Ann Hicks. She was only court of ballet, but she was rather spectacular. She had to jump like a boy and she could turn so fast. And he was so interested in her natural ability that he would start giving steps in a way for her, which challenged all of us, which all brought us up. It all helped our game. Suzanne Farrell did not have a big jump, but she had beautiful line and, you know, looked gorgeous in adagios and had an amazing way of turning with no force, just effortlessly sail around for four pirouettes on point. Just uh. So he was analyzing how she did it, and he didn't use that to teach us. And he said that, he would say that, he said it in books that he took from the dancers too. But you see, the whole company benefited, and we all had to learn from each other, filtered through balancing, if I am making myself clear. It wasn't that he just had his class and his way of doing things, and it was like that, and it never changed, and to hell with everybody else. No, he would see what worked on different bodies, adapt that so we didn't have to like look like that other dancer. I mean, to say he's a genius is not just his choreography. And in closing, he said, you know, I'll be, I'll, you know, dear, I'll be remembered more for my teaching than for my ballets. And I used to disagree. I'd say, no, are you kidding? Serenade will last forever. And probably will. But um, he had a point, he always had a point, that what he was able to push the human body to do without becoming acrobatic, he said, you know, dear, if you want to go see tricks, go to the circus, because seals can twist a ball on their nose better than humans. Man can't do anything. We only have two arms, two legs. We have to use what we have. So um, anyway, uh, all these memories flood back when I start talking about them. So that's it about the balancing class. It was a very classical, traditional in a sense class, emphasizing movement over, the, uh, over a series of uh, pretty poses, which is more of Ganova. Um, the classes changed over the years. I was very, very lucky. I think I got some really good years. He was very inspired by Farrell, and then Gelsey, of course, and then Merrill, and maybe a little bit me, even. Um, and it was uh, wonderful to, that's a cliche, but it, it was beyond belief, my timing, that I had such great timing. And I don't think you can dance balancing absolutely as well as one could without those classes. You can't get it in rehearsal. You can't, there's no time in rehearsal um, for all the stories and all the nuance and all the intricacies of, of Balanchine's teaching style. But it wasn't jazzy. 
It wasn't modern. It wasn't acrobatic. Intensely musical. But I'll leave that for another day. So I hope this, uh, you know, was interesting for some of you people that are interested in the way it was under Balanchine's day in the last century. <laughs> I feel like a relic. Um, and Clifford out again. Bye.